So, uh, <coughs> the last talk today, today will be given by Alf Onschus, Groups Definable in Geometric Fields. So, thank you, and thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to speak and for inviting me to this wonderful trimester in IHP. Uh, yeah, we got already like, two complaints about the colors. It looks much better on the screen in the TV, but can't change it right now. But. So I'm going to talk about groups definable in geometric fields. So first I'll tell you what a geometric field is. So a geometric field is, uh, is, is a field, and uh, I'll assume I'm only working in the language of rings. And uh, it's algebraically bounded, and it's definably closed in algebraic closure. So this just means perfect. So what is algebraically bounded? It means that if you have any sort of algebraicity, you can witness it sort of uniformly by polynomials. So this definition, given any formula, you can find a final number of polynomials such that if you have algebraicity in the formula with some parameters, you will be with, able to, with, to like pinpoint all the roots by one of the polynomials. Okay? Okay. And these are examples of uh, geometric fields. They're real closed fields, paddockly closed fields, pseudo-finite fields, and a generalization of this that is called bounded to algebraically closed fields. I'm not going to talk too much about this last three, um, but just let me tell you really quickly, bounded means that its absolute Galois group has a finite number of elements of every given order. And pseudo-algebraically closed means that uh, if that any absolutely reducible variety has points in your field. Um, this has generalizations, and they were studied very much by Samaria, Montenegro. Pseudo-real closed field and pseudo-padically closed field, I'm not going to mention this in the talk, but pseudo-real closed is, once it's bounded, what it means is that um, you, have to, you have to put points, that your field has points in any algebra, uh, algebraically reducible variety that doesn't mess up any of the orders they already have. So if you have any order of your structure and you have a pseudo um, absolutely reducible variety, if every possible closure of every order that you had in your field has points, then your field has points. Okay. Again, um, yeah. All right, so the starting point and the, most of this talk is going to be around this, this theorem, which is a group configuration theorem for all geometric fields. It's a, in a paper by Grushovsky and Pillay. They proved that if you had any group definable in any of these fields, T will always be the theory of one of these fields throughout this talk. If you have uh, two elements, A and B, whose dimension is as large as the dimension of the group, once you have a geometric field, you have Algebraic closure is a nice dimension. So when I mean dimension, I mean algebraic dimension. And they are algebraic independent. Then you can find some group H that has all these relations. So you may have to increase your set of definition. But once you increase it, you have that A is interalgebraic with A prime, B is interalgebraic with C, B prime, and C is interalgebraic, A, C, which is A times B, is interalgebraic with the product on the H side. So let me write this down because this is going to be very useful throughout the talk. So I have G, and here I have A and B independent. And, uh, and generic, dimension generic. So um, yeah. Then I can find. A prime and B prime and an algebraic group H such that I have A interalgebraic. Again, once I add something to the base, but I'm just going to give you the picture. And here I have A and I multiply them in G. And this is going to be interalgebraic with some C prime, 
which is equal to A prime times B prime in the group H, right? So um, in this paper, they um, studied the consequences of this group configuration. And there were three settings. And I'm not going to say exactly the theorems about the three settings, but just tell you that this breaks out into two parts. On one hand, when you have some topology there, which is the case of the paddocks or the reals, I can find local group uh, homomorphisms. So I can find some u. I want it to be a neighborhood of the identity, so I really find it around A and then translate by A inverse. And I can find the same thing on the other side, so it would be around A prime inverse. And here I have a local group homomorphism. So this side lives in H, this side lives in G, and I have a local group homomorphism between the two. This is going to be a uh, one of the ideas that I'll mention around. But this is the, the, the idea that uh, I'll talk more often about. And it's that once you have these two groups, you have the group G times H. And in here, you have the type of BB prime. Then if you take the stabilizer, and I'm going to tell you what the definition of this is. then this is something that so it will be a type definable subgroup inside this group that projects onto G and onto H with finite fibers. So it will be very much like modulo finite fibers, like the graph of a function from G to H. It will be a relation from finite to finite from G to H once you take the stabilizer. And then you, you, you work with properties of PAC groups and you get an isogenous between a subgroups of finiteness of G and a Subgroup finite things of JH, and I mean, there's tons of things you can do with this. One observation, I'm going to concentrate on this thing, um, the bottom part. But from the top part, once you have this local group homomorphism, you can show that if you started with a Nash group, I'm not going to define it, then again, you look at the graph of this, and you look at the Nash closure of this group homomorphism, and then you can now also find much better results. So this is all included in Kruszowski Pillay. So this is our starting point. And then what I'm going to talk about in this, in this talk is um, how much more can we get from this setting? If, like, if you're taking a model of a real closed field, this neighborhood can be infinitesimal, for example. So this local group homomorphism is not giving you much information about the global group structures between the two. Um, and probably yes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, for this, for this, for the Nash group of isomorphisms. Yeah. Yeah. For the Nash isomorphism. Yes. For the Nash isomorphism, I need to need to be a Nash group, right? No. Okay. I'm not sure. I need to R to be a Nash group. Of an affine Nash group, yes, probably, yes, I think, I think I do, yeah. But in general, like the idea would be to, can we improve this local group homomorphism to a larger set, larger neighborhood of the identity? This is mostly what I'm going to talk about in all the, in many, some of the contexts that I mentioned as geometric fields. So before I do this, uh, let me mention a result in this direction that was uh, in Eliana Riga's PhD thesis. She was a student that he was supervised with Kobe Petersil. So she managed to take this proof and modify it in order to get U to be a generic neighborhood. So generic means that finitely, uh, when G is definably compact or bounded, you can find generic, which means that finally many um, translates of, I should write that down. It's the last thing, I think it's the last thing I need to write down. So, uh, X subset of G is generic if G is contained in a finite union 
of translates of x. Okay? And uh, using this and using the fact that we know all the dim uh, dimension one algebraic groups in real closed fields, she was able to classify or des describe all the one dimensional groups that you can possibly define in a real closed field. Um, yeah. So now I'll start talking about. So we started to think about this sort of questions, and the context we thought about this was pseudo real closed fields. So we were not in a sense that we had a stabilizer, nor were we in a place that we could have neighborhoods, because we didn't have either of these in the context we had. So let me, we're going to, we, we were able to use the same idea of the stabilizer construction. So now I'll tell you the, the definition of the stabilizer. So the stabilizer of a type in the context of uh, bounded PAC, we have non-forking, which is, uh, it works very well. It has S1 property and all these kind of things. And uh, the stabilizer is what I'm defining here. So it's uh, the set of elements, in this case, Q is a type in the graph. So it's something that looks like Q of X, X prime. So it's the elements that when I multiply the type and I take the union with the original sets of the type, this is a non-forking extension of Q. Okay? So I, I think of Q as a type over some set, some model. Yes. Yeah. Uh, where? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. All right. So this is a stabilizer. And then you take the group generated by this. So this always lives inside my, um, the group we're working with. And you take the group generated by this. And uh, well, it turns out that in this setting, you have that the stabilizer is, in fact, type definable. It's equal to, you just have to multiply two times this SDQ to get your full uh, group generated, and it is a type definable subproof of G cross H, which maps with finite fibers onto both sides, which is what I mentioned here. Um, yeah. So this stabilizer idea was then um, generalizing context where you didn't talk about the non-forking ideal, but you talked about some other ideal on uh, definable sets by Krushovsky. So the S1 property is the key part in any of the stabilizer proofs and even in ours. So the, stable, the S1, so you have an ideal, so something that looks small. And you are going to say that this ideal is S1 if whenever you start in the discernible sequence and you have two formulas, if the conjunction of these two formulas is in your ideal, it's because either one of them was in the ideal. Okay? So, um, One way to think about this one thing is in the like non-forking ideal in, in, I think, NAP structures even, over a, once you fix a model, is going to be an S1 ideal. But another one is it's that I really like is to think about if you have um, a Kiesler measure, so you have something that measures uh, definable sets and it's invariant under some model, then it's very likely that if phi has finite measure, then you could have intersections that have measure zero. So the non measure, the measure zero ideal does not have as one. But if your context, if your theory has finite measure, then it's impossible to have two things of two subsets of finite measure that intersect in measure zero and that's our indiscernible sequence, because indiscernibility will show you that the measure is um, running wild. So this, this, this two contexts for me are, are great intuitions to what S1 ideals are. All right, and then uh, we will define a model M, and G will be an M-definable group, setting the context. And I'm going to define some measure that is S1. And I'm going to, the same definition that I gave for the stabilizer, I'm going to, well, I think I just need this one, but. So S of Q of R is exactly the same as I had before, except that I can choose, this to be a Q. So G times Q union R is wide, so non-forking. Wide means not in the ideal. The stabilizer of P is going to be the stabilizer of P and P, the ST. So it's the set of G's that the GP union P is outside your ideal 
you want things to be not in your ideal. And the stab of fee is a group generated by STP. So this is sort of. Yeah, yeah, I, I have mu ideal definable in subsets of G and I need, no, I, I will use afterwards that have invariance, but I think that, I don't think for the definitions I need anything. And then once you have, this is um, the stabilizer theorem that Shrosky proved for the um, approximate subgroup context. So you have mu and m invariant ideal. So m invariant means that when you have automorphisms that fix m, your measure doesn't change between the definable sets. And you want it to be stable on the left multiplication. So the measure of phi is the same measure as g times phi. And you find some x, a subset of G that is M definable, and such that mu is S1 on x, x inverse x. I think this is enough, but no. And if I take a Q, a mu y type, so something that has no formulas that lie inside mu, that are concentrating on x, and I assume something that is the F condition, um, I have tuples such that both A over M B and B over M A are both non-forking over M. So this is always true in NTP2 structures. That is the concept I'm looking at. So this condition F will be satisfied for the rest of the lecture. And if some, yeah, you don't know what, not, yeah, I, I don't want to define non-forking because I can concentrate in, in other parts. Then the stabilizer of Q is a wide type definable subgroup of G and in fact, you just need to have Q inverse Q squared and you have the full group generated by the stabilizer. So, and it's going to be wide. So uh, no definable set that comes here will be um, in the ideal. Okay, no? I think I covered it right, I hope. <laughs> All right. Okay, so now, our context will, as I said, always be NTP2. This, uh, all, the, all, the examples, all the examples I gave you of geometric fields are NTP2. And the only thing you need to know about this is that condition F is satisfied. So I will not need to mention condition F again. But for the theorems, uh, if you want the theorems in a more general context, you will need to have um, this condition F. So if you have a G a group in an omega saturated model M of an NTP2 theory T, which is a geometric field. So geometric field and NTP2, all the examples I mentioned are these conditions. And assume that T admits an M invariant ideal mu G on G is stable under left and right multiplication. So now I'm, uh, this is the theorem we will prove and we will need to have left and right, but this is, one can always achieve this. And I'll mention, well, not sure, but I'll tell you how you can achieve this in the context that I will apply it. Then there is an algebraic group H and a definable finite to one group of homomorphism from a type definable white subgroup D of G and H of M. So I should have here G and here H. So we're getting this result, but with um, this neighborhood being generic, so uh, wide, which will be generic for most of the things that we will take. So let me show you, um, to prove this, we actually needed to um, prove a different stabilizer theorem, but if you look at the statement of the stabilizer theorem, it, it's, you won't, I mean, let me tell you why we needed that statement. So you try to prove this, and, uh, well, sorry, no, before that, this is a good comment. So if G is amenable, then one can always find, uh, um, we, we, we will be able to find D that is generic for the group. This is what I was mentioning before. Okay, so we try to use Rzhovsky's theorem. So we have the, we start with the group configuration. We can actually find this A and this B such that type of A over MB is um, wide. And we can actually find them so that these two elements are inter non-forking over M. So A is non-forking over MB and B is non-forking over MA. 
So we have that the type of AA prime has finite fibers. And this is good because remember, we, we only start with an ideal on G. And we want to apply the stabilizer on G cross H. So we somehow need to find some group where some ideal on G cross H that relates to our ideal, but such that in G cross H, we still have S1. Okay? And we have no control what happens with H. Now, if we take the sets that have finite fibers in G cross H, those will be S1. Because if you think of S1, this is, cannot be violated just by having finite fibers. Because you will start repeating yourself and have a large intersection. Okay? So you will have mu to be S1 on the type AA prime, but you will not be able to, um, we need, and, and this implies that mu will, I can find some definable set containing the type I want, which has finite fibers on G, and this will imply that I have S1 on this set. But I didn't need S1 on the set, I needed this one on X, X inverse X. So could we find some X0 even smaller, such as S, S, S mu is S1 on X, X0 inverse? And it's really, I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's hard. Even take, take the full type PP inverse. So we have some A realizing P and A prime varies with finitely many fibers. You multiply with its inverse, and that would be finally many fibers for the identity. But if you choose a different B and different realizations that lie on top of B, and you multiply them by B inverse, basically you're saying that for any choice that you take of realizations of P, doing this process will eventually not add any more elements. And yeah, so this is surprisingly like this, this statement, which is, it's in fact true, but because of the theorem that we proved. I don't know any other proof of this. So we couldn't find a way of getting uh, an S1 ideal on G cross H that, sorry, some X, and I, some, an S1 ideal on G cross H that sort of, does it make, make any sense? So let me just say something really quick. So I have G and I have G cross H here. And here I have an ideal that I want to be large. And somehow I, I want to, um, to pull up this into some ideal mu. And this one is S1. And I want to find this S1 on something that looks like this. So this is what we would want to do in order to uh, apply the stabilizer theorem. But yeah, we were not able to do this. So what we did instead was to prove a different stabilizer theorem where we don't require that you uh, are S1 on this sort of multiplications, but only on generic multiplications. So For the purposes of the proof of this theorem, we have mu, and we, have, we, we decide that mu is still the ideal that projects into large RDS on G. And then we choose a different ideal, lambda, which is sort of like taking sets of finite measure on an infinite measure set. But in this case, our lambda is going to be sets that project into finite fibers on both G and H. Okay, so we know that in this lambda, in any set that projects on finite fibers on G, and uh, I will have that mu is S1. So in particular, in this lambda, mu will be S1. And this is the stabilizer theorem that we proved. So we have mu and lambda to be m invariant ideals, and we want them to be invariant under both left and right multiplication. Mu is S1 on any x in lambda, which happens when you take finite fibers. Uh, and we need the following conditions to apply. Both talk about multiplications of types, but only multiplications of non-forking elements. So this means you choose a realization C of Q, then choose a realization D, which is non-forking over M and C, and you multiply C and D. Okay? And then if the multiplication was medium, which means was not in lambda, so finite fibers, then the original type was medium. And this would be if you take A and B satisfying 
the same thing. We now have generic multiplication, then the multiplication is medium. Okay? So what I'm saying now, I don't need that A and A. I, not, I didn't, don't need to have finally many fibers on top of the identity. I just need that if A is non-forking over B, then A times B inverse has finite fibers uh, whenever we have it. But this is a more general context, and I really, um, yeah, I mean, we, we need it, and I'm going to only going to talk about the application of the stabilizer theorem with lambda being this finite fiber sort of idea, but it works in, in any context, the stabilizer theorem. And then the, 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 the conclusion is the same. I have the stabilizer of P can be already generated by P, P inverse squared, and it's going to be a connected, type definable wide and medium group. So as a consequence of this theorem, in fact, P, P inverse squared does have finite fibers, but we need to prove the theorem or to prove that. Okay, so this is the stabilization theorem. And um, all right. so now, how do you prove the theorem that I was mentioning? You have uh, some field, and you have, and you want to find this this finite fiber sort of thing. I already more or less told you what it was. So we apply the stabilizer theorem, and we will immediately get some D subset of, um, so we have a D, a subgroup of G cross H type definable that projects finite fibers on G and finite fibers on H. So, th so this D is already a finite to finite correspondence between a type definable group in G, type definable group in H, and no moreover because, um, and, and it's mu wide. Um, so, yeah, this is what it was, sorry, this is not. I was, I was, I, I, I run ahead. I can't read from that far, so I was running ahead a slide. Uh, so this is basically the construction that we're doing and the reason why A and B hold, it's, it's actually quite simple. So even this one, the one that you multiply and if the multiplication is medium, then the original was medium, is, is just like this, it's an algebraic relation. So now, that's what I was telling you. So now we have stub P to be a type definable subgroup G of G cross H with finite fibers on both projections. And then how do you uh, make it into a function that goes from G into H? Well, you just take the inverse of the identity in G intersected with K. This is going to be finite and normal. So its centralizer is going to be uh, is going to be a large, generic, large dimension group, and since K is connected, what's K1? This is, it's not K1, sorry, it's K fin. Yeah. Yeah, this is this. So the centralizer of K1 will contain the connected component of K, because you just take intersection of centralizers, K1 is finite, K fin is finite, sorry, or either one, K, K fin is equal to K1. And, uh, and this implies that it since K is connected, I will have immediately that it's going to be central in K, okay? So then you can take the centralizer in H of the projection of this K fin, and this is going to be an algebraic subgroup of H of finite index. Since it's an algebraic subgroup of H of finite index and H is an algebraic group, I can actually mod out by this and get a different algebraic group. And now the projection of D into G will have just one element, which means I have a function from G into H. Well, from a generic subgroup of G into H. So that's a theorem. That's how you prove it the, after using the stabilizer theorem. And uh, as a corollary, this is a very nice corollary that I don't think it was known before. If you have G, a torsion-free group definable on real closed field R, then there is an algebraic group H such that G is definably isomorphic to H of R. And it's actually immediate from the, from the theorem. So the way it works is if G is torsion-free, you know it's solvable, so it's amenable, like abstract, like discreetly amenable. So it's amenable as it's definably amenable, and you know also that G equals D0, 0, 0. So now, since D, did I write anything? Yeah. So now D has to be G, because a subset of G, which contains D0, 0, 0, so it's the same. 
So I have a function from G into an algebraic group H. Right? So this could, in principle, have a finite kernel, but it can't because the kernel of this function has to be a subgroup of G, and G is torsion-free, so it cannot be a finite subgroup. So you immediately get that it has to be defined isomorphic to um, H of R. Is that right? Sorry? Yes. No, the finite index subgroup of H of, I mean, if I, the finite index subgroup, I, I can model by H. I'm just worried about the R points. You can always model by the, by the centralizer of H, no? And get another algebraic group. Is that right? Yeah, I'll do things. You're right. But I do get a definable isomorphism into some subgroup of H, which is a finite index. Sorry, yes. OK. It's an embedding into linear groups, also, right? Sorry? It's an embedding of G into the linear group of R. What other algebraic torsion free groups? Algebraic torsion free groups? Like any. Super sub of, oh yeah, they're all upper triangular, I think. Well, yeah, 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 yes, you're right. All right, so this, all the, oh, sorry, I should mention, up to here, everything that he mentioned was joint work with, with Pierre Simon and Samaria Montenegro, and uh, yeah. All right, so now uh, we were thinking with, um, with a student of mine, Juan Pablo Costa, which is actually here, who is actually, who is actually here. And, uh, and what happens in the Piatti case? So in the Piatti case, and uh, again, I have an algebraic group H and a definable finite to one group homomorphism from a tight definable Y subgroup D of G into H of A. So again, as in the theorem, I can go up by a finite in the subgroup of G and uh, modding, up, modding, about, modding out by a finite subgroup, we can assume the function is one to one. Again, the image may be a finite in the subgroup of, of H, but it's not, it's an embedding. And this function can be chosen to have continuous image. This is um, cell decomposition the paddocks. And, uh, and also to have a continuous image. So it's, the image can be an open subset of, like if it's, if it's not open to start with, I take out something of smaller co-dimension and I get an open subset. And this theorem, and the, I, I read it here in this manner because it's exactly the same theorem we take, we get for PRC, or the proof is much more involved. But if G is definably amenable, then I can find some G1 finite index in G and some K, a finite central subgroup of G1, such that G1 mod K is a definable uh, Lee group, I'll tell you a little bit about this, with a finite covering of open subsets, diffeomorphic in an open neighborhood algebraic group. Now, in the paddocks, we know what a paddock Lee group is and what a diffeomorphism is. In the case of PRC, we have to, have to redefine the topology with all the possible orders. So for us, open will be intersection of things that are open in every one of the orders, and then Lee just means that it can cover this with diffeomorphisms. And, uh, so this is the theorem that I get. Now, um, that we get, that we get. <laughs> in the PRC, bounded PRC case with Samaria and Pierre, and uh, in the QP case with Juan Pablo. Now, in the, in the Piatic case, you have more, because you know that G is already a Piatic Lie group by Anand's results. So now you have something that's finite index in G, so G1 is also a Piatic Lie group, and somehow the lifting so the, the covering of G1 mod K can be lifted to a covering of G1, just because, um, yeah, you know the topology on G1, so you can pull up the open sets intersecting with, with things that, um, 
yeah, with, with subsets that projected one to one into G1 mod K. So you can actually like um, forget this blue part and you have that any amenable group G defined in QP then is going to be how, admit a finite covering of things that are um, low, like uh, they're diffeomorphic to open neighborhoods of algebraic group. And uh, last week, uh, there was a talk by Yao that announced that every dimension one periodic Lie group was, group definable in the periodics was abelian by finite. And any abelian by finite group is immediately discreetly amenable. So um, any dimension one group is amenable and you can apply this theorem. So for any dimension one definable group, you can admit a finite covering of subsets, each of which is um, polynomially asymorphic to an algebra, open, open subset of an algebraic group. So I think this is. Sorry, no, like, the, like, uh, so, so around the identity is going to be a local homomorphism. Yeah, and then it's, it's be given by polynomials, basically. That's what we get. So I don't know how to call that. <laughs> so what are you thinking about the So you, you have a covering by, um, so you will have an open, so I, I should write it down. You have G and have some U subset of G and H, and I have V subset of H, and this is open. And uh, we have a local group of morphism. Between U and G and V. And uh, G is equal to union of A, I, U. And in the intersections, these maps behave nicely. That's, that's all I know. So the group operation on G might be different than the one in H, but like locally, you have a, a local group isomorphism, and, um, and you have a finite covering of G that behaves nice on intersections. Sorry? Don't think so, but I'm not sure. I don't know. Always? Yeah. Oh. Okay. So what you're saying is maybe what you're saying is you would actually open subjects by means of the identity. Maybe that's something I could be saying, but I know. <laughs> I'm not certain. <laughs> All right, so yeah, this is this is the statement that we that we have, and then I mean, things that Juan Pablo is, is thinking about is what this. So in a paper in 2005 that we had with Anand, we were um, talking about some conjecture on the behavior of G mod G zero zero. Well, not G mod G zero zero, but so it was trying to bring the conjecture of a minimal groups that. G mod G00 was a uh, Lie group of the same dimension to the periodic case. And we knew this couldn't be true. So um, the conjecture that Anand had and that we wrote in the paper was that every periodic, um, every group definable in the periodics admitted uh, open subgroup H, such that H mod H00 was a periodic Lie group of the same dimension as H. And uh, well now, like we proved this theorem for elliptic curves, and I think that the other dimension one groups are easier. So this, I mean, this, it should follow one, should prove them in this conjecture for dimension one case at least, by just using this um, covering the femorphism. All right. And uh, well, the ongoing work, we're trying to prove the, well, so, you know, trying to prove, it. we've been talking about proving the same theorem for pseudo padic closed bounded fields with uh, Pure and Samaria. And uh, I put this down so we would sort of force ourselves to start <laughs> thinking this up. And then um, 
the other thing is that once you have, like, not in all PRC fields, because we don't have a T topology for all PRC fields, but in some PRC fields, we do have a T topology, so we can go into this direction. And then maybe one could have um, sort of use this U to um, send G into the uh, automorphism group of the tangent space of H, which is an algebraic group. It's, it's very nicely behaved. And uh, so in the case that G is, is simple, then this should imply some strong relation between G and H. In some sense, we're thinking about this. I think in the, in the Piatic case, I think this is a theorem that, um, well, close to a theorem by McPherson and Kuba. And, uh, and the nice thing about having something about simple groups and about amenable groups is that somehow this, these things tend to be orthogonal, at least in many cases you have a simple part and amenable part and you can somehow try to extend things. So maybe you can combine this proof here once you know you have a simple quotient and have the simple by amenable and then maybe say something else about more complex groups. So yeah, this is all I wanted to say about it. Thank you.